Hello and welcome to everyone who has joined us so far. Um, I'm really excited to welcome you all to our last MIT abstract of the year. We have an extremely exciting talk lined up for you today um, with a really, really exciting person. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Fatima Hussein, and I'm a PhD student here at MIT uh, studying ancient earth uh, and, and uh, how life has evolved on it. So today we're gonna we're gonna kick off with our last MIT abstract and just a brief note for those of you who may not be familiar with the term, an abstract is just a snapshot of a research uh, paper uh, or or in general research, and we're giving you an abstract of an exciting person at MIT through this series. So you're getting that snapshot just like scientists do when they read research papers. I'm so incredibly excited today to introduce you all to our speaker, Dr. Sananda Sharma. She is a creative biologist and a designer and she's been at MIT for quite a while. She just recently finished her PhD doing some really cool stuff in biology and design that she's gonna tell you all about today. And I also have to say, Sananda is a personal role model for me. Um, and it's been nothing since inspiration on my end since I got to, to meet her a little while back. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn off my screen share and I'm going to say hello to Dr. Sananda and, and thank her for joining us today. Hello. Hey there. Hey Fatima, so, hey North Anglia. How's hello. everyone doing? <laughs> I think everyone is super excited just as much as I am here. So uh, Sananda, you may not be able to tell because this is very, very realistic, but I'm not actually on Killian Court right now with it snowing. It is December, but we don't actually have snow here in Cambridge. I'm sitting in my kitchen talking to you. You look like you're under a microscope, but I suspect that's not the case. Well, I mean, uh, you're, you're more or less right. I am under a microscope. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, this is a microscope slide, a picture that I took. This is my virtual background because it's much more exciting than the Airbnb living room I'm in right now in East Cambridge. Oh my goodness, awesome. Well, I'm so excited to hear your chat. I'm going to uh, let you share your screens now and to, to kick us off. Sounds great. I'll just bring up the slide and we'll be on our way. Okay, can you see the slides well? Yep, we can see them. Great. So, hi everyone. My name is Sunanda. I'm a creative biologist and designer. As Fatima said, thank you for the really nice introduction. Um, I gave this job title to myself and it describes the type of work that I like to do, which is an interdisciplinary approach to science and art. So I'll share with you a bit of my journey and a couple of the research projects that I've done. And I'm excited to connect with a really great group today from North Anglia. Um, and yeah, let's go ahead. Okay, so um, rewinding a little bit my personal clock, I graduated high school in 2010, which feels like a very long time ago now. Um, in school, I liked everything. I loved poetry, writing, I did sports, science fairs, debate, and I came to MIT uh, back in 2010 to do a bachelor's degree in biology, which is when I first dove into research. So I actually had a hard time with tests and some of the ways that we traditionally teach science in classes. Um, but I joined a neuroscience lab as a freshman. It was a big wow moment for me. This is where science comes into practice. It's hands on. Things are changing all the time. And I thought it was the most exciting thing. Um, I got to study how brains develop, how memories are formed and linked to emotions and how physical space is mapped in the brain. So how does your brain know where you are in the world and how does it remember those places? I got the chance to uh, keep studying neuroscience in internships in Paris during my time as an undergrad and learn more about microscopy, making really beautiful images of tiny things. So by the time I finished college, I knew I really liked research, I liked photography and I liked traveling. I didn't really know what I wanted to do next, and I just began talking to a lot of people. So this is how I met my eventual advisor for my master's and my PhD at the MIT Media Lab, Professor Neri Oxman. Her area of work is in design and architecture, so inspired by and integrated with nature. Her questions are, can we learn from nature, work with it, and create products and buildings that live, breathe, decay, and work better with the natural environment? So this was a pretty big shift for me, going from biology into architecture and design as part of the Mediated Matter Group at the Media Lab. 
And when I joined, the group had no biologists and no scientists. So everyone else was a designer uh, or architect or engineer. And this brought up the divide between science and arts for me. And people always asked me if I was a scientist or if I was a designer. And the answer was always the same, and it still is the same, which is both. So I've kind of jumped my way across subfields in both of these areas, starting with neuroscience and winding my way around this circle. And the big shifts, um, which is like cell biology to architecture or digital fabrication to entomology, the study of insects, these are some of the most exciting points because I entered a new area with the perspective of an old one. So you're perfectly in the right place to learn from and contribute to a new group of people and to make a powerful change together. So in all of the projects I'm gonna show you, um, art is foundational to the scientific research and vice versa. And this is actually a really old tradition. So in the area of biology in particular, some of the biggest discoveries that we know about the natural world came through the practice of art. So this is one of my favorite examples and I show it in every talk I do because I love it so much. Um, this is artwork made uh, on insect metamorphosis by naturalist Maria Sibylla Marion. And she lived at the end of the 1600s in Europe. So several hundred years ago now, she studied insects her whole life and she created these beautiful sketches and paintings of her subjects. And actually through her illustrations, we learned about the life cycles of insects, where and how they live and how they fit into their environments. And this was totally not known before that period. People weren't sure, how do moths happen? <laughs> where do they come from? And because of her detail and the illustrations that she was able to make, she had art leading science, providing a new path towards discovery that wouldn't have otherwise been possible. And this tradition continues in design today. So designers are now dealing with the properties of life. So growth, self-repair, structure, response, and of course, beauty. And they've created a world of possibilities for products and architectures. So here are some of my uh, inspirations, my most favorite recent examples. So a shirt made of leather made by microorganisms called yeast, a building material made from mushrooms, and a project that seeks to bring back the scent of extinct flowers. So by linking science and art, you get the best of both worlds, in my opinion. You can explain, answer, uh, solve, and investigate while also exploring, questioning, identifying problems, and imagining worlds that don't exist yet. So the first project that I'll share, and this is the first one that I did in graduate school, was to create a space where all of this work can happen. So where scientists and artists and engineers and designers can all meet and work side by side. So along with other members of the research group I joined, I designed and led a new laboratory space in our building that actually used to be a kitchen, but we changed that a lot. So you can do biological research in there safely. So this isn't a typical lab in a lot of ways. We wanted there to be transparency. People should see what's going on in there and be able to engage with it. And there should be an opportunity to display the research as well as actually conduct it and ways to embrace all of the tools and people that are involved with interdisciplinary research. So along with the very varied team of people with a lot of different backgrounds, we also cultivated a team of organisms of different kinds. So here you can see some E. coli on the left side, um, Aspergillus fungus, a protein called tyrosinase that's working in a chemical reaction, and a silkworm that should be climbing. Um, so yeah, there you go. Um, we had all of these and more in our lab, and I was lucky enough to work with them in my research. So I'll talk through two of the projects that involved a few of these species, starting with silk. So silk is a material that a lot of you might be familiar with. It's often found in clothing. It's really soft, it's smooth, it's expensive, it's very beautiful. And it's been a part of human history for literally thousands of years. And it's very, very common today in many places in the world. So what you might not know is where silk comes from. These little animals called silkworms or by their scientific name, Bombyx mori, they're responsible for producing nearly all the silk that we use around the world today. They also have a very complicated history with humans over the past several thousand years. And they're recognized as these fascinating fabricating insects in our world, along with bees that make those beautiful honeycombs, um, wasps, which make paper nests and ants, which make of course, incredible tunnels. These animals normally form little cocoons, which are taken and used to make silk thread and textiles. And so you can see a little silkworm <laughs> spinning on the left side there. And on the right side, you can see this is what silk looks like under the microscope. 
So usually in a really industrial process that's harmful to the silkworm and very focused on humans, humans take that silk and use it to make textiles. Um, and one of the questions that we thought about here was, can we shift that balance back to the silkworm? Can we do a project that cares about the silkworms as much, if not more, than it does about humans and human outcomes? So the first part of this for me was to get a better understanding of what silkworms do and how they behave. So we studied the life cycle of a silkworm, which begins as an egg and hatches into a worm that eventually spins a very thick silk cocoon and it emerges as an adult moth. And then you repeat the cycle <laughs> many times. And during most of its life, the silkworm only eats one thing, which is mulberry leaves. And at some point in its development, the anatomy of the worm changes and it starts to begin spinning the silk. And there were a lot of questions that kept coming up. So why do cocoons look like they do? How come silkworms only make these particular shapes? Could they be convinced to make other forms that are on the scale of architecture rather than on the scale of a shirt? And the answer to a lot of these questions is, I don't know, which means it's a really good idea to start exploring there. Um, so the mediated matter group had previously shown that silkworms can spin flat instead of cocoons if they're giving a flat surface to spin on, which opens up this opportunity of creating customized silk sheets through simple physical and geometrical templates. We studied how silkworms respond to heat, to different material surfaces, to structures like here and, and to other silkworms also. So as you can see, they really like climbing upwards. And so we wanted to leverage that particular natural behavior. So we created a rotating mechanical system that will move as silkworms climb upwards. So there's this very large metal frame that you see on the screen and there's a large knit piece of fabric which was stretched to act as a base and a scaffold for the worms. So over the course of many days, we put over 17,000 silkworms on its surface and they spun to complete the structure. So we like to say that we're collaborating with the silkworms here. Um, we did all of this work in Italy last year in this in the shed in Northern Italy, and we were learning from a silk research institute that's near Venice. So here you can see some of the images of the pavilion as it's being made. You can see all these little worms on the surface spinning their very specific textures and patterns. And after they spin, they fall off and land safely as pupa on this sheet that we had underneath, and they're ready to metamorphosize as adults. So in this way, we preserve the life cycle of the worm. And in the end, we did succeed in creating a new type of architecture that has never been made before. So this is the pavilion called Silk 2, and it was presented at the Museum of Modern Art in New York as part of the material ecology exhibit by my professor earlier this year. And at the same time, we're working on a research paper that focuses on the behavior of silkworms and uses a lot of data that we collected during our time in Italy. So this combination, an art exhibition and a scientific paper, that's a really exciting one for me because it shows you can contribute to both sides, communicating in a language that people in those fields appreciate at the same time. So I'm still really excited about silkworms. Actually, I have some growing in my house right now. So the research always continues. <laughs> so the second project that I'll go through is about pigments. So these are the biochemical colors of life. If you think a lot about life that you might know um, or you're familiar with, it's pretty clear that a lot of the things in the natural world are colored. So think butterflies, dogs, horses, anything. There's a lot of color usually in their wings or coats or things like that. And there's many groups of pigments, some that you might be familiar with, like chlorophylls, which give the green color to plants. And some you might know less about, such as carotenoids from vegetables or hemocyanin from horseshoe crabs and melanins, which are also found across the different kingdoms of life. So melanin is found in feathers, it's found in fur and wings, such as those of the monarch butterfly. It's been found in fossils of cuttlefish that are dating back over 160 million years, so back to the time of the dinosaurs. And it's commonly found in fungi, giving colors to things like black mold. It's also found in humans. It's found in our skin, our hair, lips, eyes, brain, inner ear, liver, many other places. And this is where you might know the term melanin from. It can protect very efficiently against things like UV radiation from the sun, and they have a lot of other functions that, that we're still finding out about today. So these are just a few examples of melanin in nature. So there's also types of synthetic melanins, including pink colors and brown colors that can be made in lab through a very simple chemical process shown here. And this is what that reaction actually looks like in plates in lab. So you can see the colors are changing over time and space. And this indicates that new chemicals and new chemical structures are being formed in each well. 
And this is affected by a lot of factors, such as if the chemicals are solid or liquid, if they're exposed to air or not. And in addition to the lab science, we also read about the history of these pigments and talked to authors, artists, and designers about their experiences with it and the way that we can be most respectful and thoughtful when engaging in this kind of work. So we were able to make a library of colors that show the diversity of pigments from nature. And we began to 3D print objects with pigments inside using a new type of liquid printing. So 3D printing is very similar to 2D printing, except instead of having a sheet of paper with words on it, for instance, you will have a three-dimensional object that comes out like what's in my hand in this picture. So in this case, the art we wanted to create pushed the science we were doing, and we had to develop new ways to do 3D printing and develop new technologies to make this happen. So then we scaled this new technique that we developed to make a three meter tall column. And this was shown as part of an exhibition in Milan last year. And the center column, uh, center of the column had this tall 3D print in it and that had six distinct channels inside it. And melanin in each of these channels was derived from a different source. So there was some cuttlefish ink, we had mushroom enzyme, we had bird feathers, all ethically sourced as well. And this object illustrates the diverse origins of the pigment and the recognition of it as once again, not uniquely human. So there's sort of a trend in my work that we're trying to focus on everything but the human as well, because we're only one of over 8.5 million species on the planet, at least. <laughs> so we designed and built a few more columns and brought them to join the Museum of Modern Art show as well. And these ones contain melanins from plant uh, seed coats and spices, as well as those from mushroom chemicals. And at the same time that this was being shown in museums, we were also inspired to keep pushing on the science side. So it turns out that melanins are not only good at protecting against the type of radiation that we feel on Earth that gives us sunburns, um, there's another type of radiation that exists more in space beyond the protective atmosphere of Earth called ionizing radiation. And there's a lot of bacteria and fungi on the International Space Station that produce melanins and other types of pigments, and it might help in their survival. So I began to study pigment forming bacteria and fungi in the context of space biology, asking if they would be able to survive in space conditions better than humans or other organisms because they make so much pigment. So these are a couple of the fungi I worked with. One makes melanins and one makes carotenoids. So we then got to test these pigment forming microbes in a nuclear reactor at MIT. And we were also very, very lucky to get a slot to send our experiment actually into space for a month. So we built a little lab home for our experiments to send them to the International Space Station, along with a lot of other experiments from MIT. And our project, along with the rest of the MIT payload, launched from Cape Canaveral on March 6, 2020, on the SpaceX Dragon capsule uh, to the International Space Station. So this was right at the same time that the other piece I mentioned was in the museum gallery. And so once again, this brings those two worlds together, the science and the art back together, and they really feed off one another. So um, I'm really grateful to have had all of these opportunities and the key in all of it is having interdisciplinary teams, people who are open and excited to share research in different ways. And I'm really excited to keep doing creative biology in the future. That is totally awesome. Let me just remind folks now that um, if you haven't submitted your questions for Dr. Sananda to cover all of the incredible things she just showed us, now is your time. Uh, and again, remember to upvote. And I do want to quickly clarify for some folks, I realized I said something a little confusing before. This is the last abstract of 2020. Lucky you, Nordanglia students, you get many more abstracts coming in the spring. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit after um, we do our awesome Q&A with Sananda. So don't fret, there are many more to come. But for now, why don't we kick off our Q&A? And I, I actually have a question to start us off, Sananda, for you. I mean, how, how do you get the pigments from like these insects and mushrooms? Like how do you take them out of those organisms? Yeah, so um, a lot of this is based on research that people have been working on for over a hundred years actually. So one thing is that um, feathers and wings and things like that, you can, if you look under the microscope, see that there's structures of these little pigment blobs in there. And then there's the structural proteins around it. So what you can do is put it into a certain chemical that breaks down the proteins and then it releases the pigments from say a bird feather. 
And then from mushroom enzymes, you can actually order the enzyme online. You bring it with the right amino acid substrate, which is a part of a protein building block. And then you can start to create this melanin in your own lab space. So you're telling me that me and the Nord Anglia students listening can order this and try to, you know, take a step <laughs> ourselves. I think the easiest way probably would be to get some squid ink or cuttlefish ink. That has a lot of melanin in it. And, and you can think about at the same time is why does a bird, which flies above the earth, have the same pigment that a squid, which leaves, lives deep under the ocean, how come they have the same pigment? Unsolved mystery. So. <laughs> okay, well, catch me at the fish market after this, okay? <laughs> um, we, we have a question from um, one of the folks, uh, one of the Nord Anglia students on the call, and they're wondering, are that they notice that the silkworms look like caterpillars. Are they technically caterpillars? Um, so they're very related to caterpillars. Um, they are, so there's moths and there's butterflies. And for the different um, larval stages, so that's the sort of baby stage when they look like a caterpillar or something like that, um, you give them different sorts of names. And for silkworms, it's always been worms, but they're very similar to caterpillars in the sense that they come from an egg. They grow up from a really tiny size, like smaller than a grain of rice to bigger than my finger by the time that they're done growing and then they metamorphosize. So there's a lot of similarity. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's super cool. And I mean, can you walk us through, you, you showed us amazing pictures from these art exhibits. I mean, how did you get the silkworms and the, the art exhibit to Italy? What, I mean, what was the process like? Cause that thing was huge. Yeah. So um, the real secret is we ordered the parts and we built it in Italy. So what we did was um, we got very good at making these tiny labs in a suitcase, basically. And so we put together little labs in a suitcase and we planned out, hey, these are the things we need to build this huge metal machine in a shed in Italy, ordered all the parts. We had some great collaborators there and they helped us build it. And the same thing with the silkworms. We didn't bring them over. There's actually a whole core of silk research that's happening in northern Italy. And we had some great collaborators there in the Padova area. And so they supplied us with the worms and they taught us a lot about more about sericulture, which is the growing of silkworms and mulberry trees and everything like that. Ah, got it. And, and now we, we have a question that is gonna take you back a bit, but who, who inspired you in the first place? And I mean, how did you get interested in art and science? Ah, I think um, a lot of people in my family are in this divide as well. So my grandfather was a philosopher. And so he always encouraged me to read in every language I could. And he, he himself could read like four or five languages. So he always wanted me to read poetry and we read poetry together. And so that was this big interest in art for me. And my mom is a painter and a writer as well. My father is a scientist. And so I had this inspiration from both sides. And then I think just living in the world that we do, that we're fortunate to live in is already so inspirational. Yeah. So, I mean, how did it feel? So you, you, you told us that you, you know, first were exposed to, to neuroscience and eventually, you know, you've made this absolutely amazing transition into um, science and, and design, but what did it feel like at first when you shifted into like art? I think a Nordic English student is pretty curious about that. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll be really honest. It was uncomfortable because it's hard to not do what you're, what you know you're good at. <laughs> And it's hard to try something different. Um, but it took me about two years to sort of, you know, find my feet and say, I, I have an artistic voice. I know what I like and what I don't like, at least to start. And the best thing that I was able to do at that point was to go through every book, every catalog, every magazine, anything that I could find and see, I, I like this. This speaks to me. It feels like it feels like the art that I wish I could do and slowly built up this whole um, catalog for myself, like my own inspiration catalog. So some of some of the things were fashion shows like Alexander McQueen shows, some things were articles from Scientific American, some were just really nice pictures of raindrops and all of these things fit in my world for what art was for me. Wow, that's that's awesome. I mean, I, I think I'm gonna start cutting things out of magazines and, and posting them up and starting that way as well. <laughs> fantastic idea and sounds honestly really fun and something you could even do you know in part of art class so definitely so we have a, a question from a Nordic English student I'm going to read it directly they say 
Hello, I bought a microscope recently. What should I start examining first? I'm a seventh grader. Ah, oh, that's so exciting. Congratulations on getting a microscope. I'm very excited for you. Um, I would recommend find five things around your house. It could be part of a leaf of a plant that you have. It could be a napkin. It could be any of these things. Try to take a really thin layer of it and stick it under your microscope. Anything that you're like, that looks kind of boring to me. I don't think that's very interesting. Try those ones first. And those might be the most exciting for you. Um, so I would suggest going around things in your house. And then there's some really cool resources online where you can buy kits that people have made microscope slides for. So you can learn really what the development of a plant looks like piece by piece because people have made these slides. So there's a lot of awesome options on the internet of things you can get. Wow, and they might actually, these students, uh, you know, may be able to ask their science teachers too for some of these things, right? Definitely. And there's pretty cool and easy ways you can make slides. So if you, uh, slides are basically this little piece of glass that you stick under the microscope and it holds whatever sample that you're looking at. So whatever thing you're looking at. And all you have to do is you have a parent or someone help you or your science teacher to slice a little piece of something like a leaf, stick it on there. And then you can look at it under your microscope and you can add water or different things to try to see things a little bit differently. Oh, wow. Well, I, I, I mean, this is exciting for me as well. I want to go into the microscopy <laughs> lab after this. One thing I was wondering, you know, we have students tuning in from North Anglia on this call from all around the world. Could you tell us a little bit about where all you've gone as a result of, of your research and work and, and all this amazing stuff? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I've been so lucky and I love traveling. So that's been a really good part of it. Um, so I, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, spent a bunch of time in Paris working at a couple of labs there. I really like Paris, so I went there. I've been to South Africa doing field research for one of the projects related to pigments. Um, I've been to Italy, of course, for like a third of last year working on all of this research. Um, I've been to Houston to integrate our payload to go to space and California and India to give talks. So it's been great, really fun. Well, and I, I want to also add a um, fun fact for the listeners <laughs> in here. Um, Sananda and I, our, our labs, when, when Sananda was still at MIT, were right across the courtyard from each other. They were less than, you know, they were just a few hundred meters away. But Sananda and I actually met on the other side of the world. In <laughs> and we roomed together for a week at NASA's astrobiology summer camp. Um, so that's where we met, and, and she was my roomie, and we, we learned a bunch of astrobiology together. So she also, you know, partakes in these research camps and opportunities to learn all around the world, and, and you all have that opportunity, too, going forward. Yeah, and you can make great friends and great scientist friends. <laughs> um, you know, could you walk us through, you showed us these really beautiful time lapses of the silkworms really doing their thing, but could you tell us, like, how long it takes you know, worms to really, you know, um, build these structures. Um, mm -hmm. And also, how did you get the silkworms in the first place? Yeah, so uh, two good questions. Um, it takes silkworms several weeks to grow up from their egg state to when they're ready to spin. And then when they spin, they just, they stop eating and they just spin straight for like, a, for a couple days or so. Um, and yeah, that's just how their metabolism works. It's completely different than how we are. We can't go a few days without eating. Um, and so for, to make that whole big structure that I showed, the one that's in the museum, that took a few weeks because there were cycles and cycles of silkworms that were getting ready and then we would put them on. And we always wanted to make sure they were in good health, um, that we don't you know, stress them out or anything like that too much. Um, so yeah, what was the second question that you mentioned? Um, I, so, um how you got the silkworms. Right, yeah. So um, initially there's a few places that you can get silkworms online. The best way to do it though is if you're in a lab setting where you know that you can take care of them well and that you can do it safely both for the organisms and for yourself. So basically we worked with MIT to set up a plan so that we could work safely with silkworms and in a way that's healthy and ethical for them. And then we ordered these online. And since then we also started just growing them because um, they go through their own cycle and they'll release more eggs as they become adults. So then you can just keep growing them from there. Um, yeah. And we then had also the group from Italy that gave us silkworms to use. So you, you mentioned to us that you have some silkworm roommates. <laughs> I am assuming they're, you know, 
either they're already spinning or going to be spinning something soon for you. I mean, how do you transport that art once it's created? How fragile is it? How easily is it, you know, moved around? So um, the cool thing about silk is it's one of the toughest materials. It's sort of unsurpassed by what we've been able to make just man-made materials. It's a really, really impressive one. So if you tried to pull, pull silk thread, um, you can pull a single thread, but once you have a few pieces together, it becomes really, really hard. So a lot of the artwork actually is pretty sturdy, I would say. It's still a fabric, so you do want to have it stretched or put on a scaffold or something. Um, but yeah, and silk cocoons definitely are like very hard to break apart. It's a good protection there. So then you were able, so this is kind of how you transported um, those, those beautiful structures for, for your exhibits in MoMA, for example. And, and yeah. So we basically, actually, we looked at origami examples to see how, what's the best way to fold this big structure so that we don't have too much um, energy being released at different points or causing any kind of tension. And we folded it up and sent it in a truck <laughs> oh. yeah, and shipped it back. Yeah. Wow. And so, you know, you, you walked us through how you had to help convert a kitchen into a laboratory. And then you took us all the way through showing your work um, at, at museums. Could you tell us a little bit about how your time is distributed? I mean, are you spending a lot of time in the lab or are you at your you know, desk working on design or, or traveling? What, what's this mix for you? Yeah, so it changes through every project, I would say. It kind of has the same sort of life cycle as a silk one. So at the very beginning, um, I'm mainly at my desk, I'm sketching, I'm drawing, I'm looking at examples or videos or trying to learn things that I think are exciting. And then as I decide like, okay, this is an area that I want to explore, I then start putting together protocols. So um, plans for the lab, the next steps that I want to do, and then go to lab and spend almost 100% of my time there. And then once I feel like I've gotten some information then I start doing a little bit more 50-50. So it goes through an entire cycle and I think I really love that about my work, that it's a little different every day. Like for uh, the time I was in Mediated Matter, definitely I could come to my desk and there might be um, a frame of a beehive on there with someone saying like, hey, what's going on in this frame? Tell me. Or it could be a bunch of um, samples of bacteria that are in the lab waiting for me, ready to take a look at. And we, we have some students who are pretty intrigued in um, the idea of these organisms in space on, and on the ISS in your experiment. I mean, did you guys notice a, a change in any of the microorganisms in, in space? And one person's particularly asking if fungi can survive in space. Yeah, so answer, yes, they can survive in space. And the reason that we know is people have done these microbiome studies of the International Space Station. So the same way that your body has a microbiome of all these different organisms that help keep you healthy and alive, there's a whole microbiome of every single building that you can think of, including ones in space, like the ISS. So there's a ton of bacteria and fungi that regularly survive up there. And they've been living there for some decades at least. And some of them actually survive their exposure to space as well. So this is, they're called extremophiles. So these organisms that can survive in high amounts of radiation or really crazy temperature extremes or things like that. Um, in terms of our data, we're still going through it to see if there's really good results so far, it's gotten a little hard with COVID, but we're hoping to find some really cool information. That's, that's awesome. I, I hope you do too. I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lot of cool stuff to reveal. Now we have a, a, a question um, that I want to you know, read off directly from um, uh, Bushra Amin or one of her students. She's asking, is it hard to become a scientist? I've wanted to since I was six. Oh, um. So I don't think it is hard to become a scientist. I think sometimes people get stuck on the definition of what a scientist is. And people think that it means that you need to have a degree or you need to be in a lab or you need to have a microscope or something like that. I don't think any of that is true. A scientist is someone who's trying to understand the natural world. So if that's you, then I hereby say that you're a scientist for sure. Um, and then if you want to become a particular type of scientist, there's some amazing examples of people who have done incredible research in and out of labs. So Maria Sibylla Marion, the person I mentioned, for instance, she never had a lab. She had paint and paper, and she traveled to different places and just looked at insects and painted all of them. And she is most definitely a scientist. 
So I think if everybody can figure out what their own path is with what they have available to them and what speaks to them on the inside, you can always find your path towards science, definitely. I agree. I think that was a, a fantastic answer. Now we have a, a question that you know may be considered you know slightly philosophical here, but are there any other creatures that create art just like silkworms? Ooh. I think all of them do. That's my answer. I think all of them do. Um, I can give you some examples of ones that I think are really incredible. Um, so I mentioned bees and wasps and ants. So if you haven't checked out what those hives look like or nests look like, definitely do, because you'll be very impressed. I think bacteria can also make very, very beautiful art. Um, so for instance, there's a phenomenon called swarming. And so when you have bacteria growing on something really soft, like think like the softest jello you can think of, for instance, um, they will start to form these really crazy shapes. And if you look at it under the microscope, people call them Van Gogh bundles because it looks like the strokes of paint in Van Gogh's Starry Night. So it's quite literally an art that we can recognize. Oh, wow. That's super cool. Uh, okay, so we, we have a question um, from Miss Dumala in North Anglia, Kuwait. So, you know, far away from us in Cambridge. But, but you know, she's asking, so what happens to the silkworms, you know, when they make the silk into these really cool um, shapes and, and scaffolds? Do they survive? Yeah, so that's one of the really cool things is that if you think about why cocoons exist, so it's for protection, usually from predators or different things like that. Silkworms, the species that we work with, don't exist in the wild anymore. They're almost always on farms or in sericulture buildings or um, organizations. So they don't have predators the same way anymore. So we take very good care of them. And as they spin, normally inside the cocoon, they form into a little brown pupa. And when the pupa is ready, it turns into a moth and then it comes out of the cocoon. What happens when we have them uh, spin silk flat is they still turn into a pupa. They just don't have that cocoon around them because the silk was spent to make these sheets, but they're able to still metamorphosize and become adults and moths. So the process still continues. They don't, they don't die in the way. Ah, that's, that is good to know for sure. So we have some students who are really interested in, in pigments. I think you gave them the pigment bug, just like you did <laughs> a year ago. You know, um, could you tell us, like, what do pigments tell us about these, the, the microbes and the organisms that produce them? Does it tell us about their environment? You mentioned that we're seeing the same, you know, colorations in, in birds, but also these squids. So what does this all mean? Yeah, so I think I'll take my own advice and say, I don't know. I think it's still an area of a lot of research going on. So there's so many different types of organisms that exist and there's so many examples of pigments and the same pigment family is found in very, very different environments. So in some places like very cold regions of the world, people think that carotenoids are being formed by different types of really small microorganisms um, because it helps protect them against cold. It acts like a uh, protectant for their DNA and for their cell walls and structures. Um, for other things like with birds or for squid or cuttlefish or things like that, um, pigments can be used as part of defense. They can be used to attract mates. They can be used in warning coloration. Um, there's a lot of different potential things and it's up to us to sort of figure it out and fig figure out what those patterns are. So, so you're telling me, you know, it's okay to admit where we don't know things and kind of start from there. Absolutely. I know that I always felt a little early on, I don't wanna say I don't know because I don't wanna sound dumb. Um, and the longer I've been in research, the more I realize that that's, that's not true at all. If you admit that you don't know, that means you can begin to start to know. And the sooner you admit that, the, the better it is and the more that we can be open about exploration. And also, I've always found that if you say you don't know, there's usually at least one other person in the room who doesn't know. And so you have a buddy there. And so you'll help each other out. I, I appreciate that um, a lot. So, you know, students are pretty excited about all of this work you've, you've just mentioned. And they wanted to know, what are you working on right now? And what do you want to be working on in the future? Yeah, so, um, Right now, so I graduated and left MIT in May. And since then I've been sort of 
working on a few different projects. One thing that I want to do and I'm moving towards in the future is to dive deeper into this astrobiology space biology area. And Fatima knows this because we did the, the summer camp together last year. Um, and I want to really study why are extremophiles so extreme? So what makes some organisms able to survive in these very intense environments that we, because of how we survive, think are very extreme? What adaptations do they have and how do those things change? Are pigments a marker of extremophiles? And how does this help relate to the study of organisms that maybe live on Mars or Venus or Enceladus or other places in the universe? Got it. Yeah, I'm very, very excited about that myself, as you mentioned. So, you know, we, we're coming up uh, against the, the end of the talk and, and some of these students either have to go to bed or, or go to class after this. But someone is, is very curious about, you've mentioned all of these amazing things that you do and, and the times that you're either, you know, in the lab or, or, you know, at your desk designing and thinking. Could you tell us what a typical day looks like for you? <laughs> Out of out of 24 hours, I mean, how long are you actually doing work? And do you do you get to do stuff outside of this, or is this you know 24/7? Yeah. Um, so out of 24 hours, I would say it changes based on how we're doing the project. But I usually try to work um, 10 or 12 hours a day, which is kind of on the longer side. It's purely because I like what I'm doing so much that I'm really excited about it. Um, but of course, I like to take a break and be healthy and go out for a walk and have fun and see my family and all that stuff too. So it's not all just, I'm in the lab, not talking to anybody. And the other part is the people that I work with in lab are so exciting and all friends of mine that it's a real pleasure to be with them for most of it. So um, yeah, usually in the morning I would come to lab. I do some reading because I always find that's nice to set an intention. It might be poetry. It might be a short story. It might be a paper, any of these things. And then I draw out my tasks or I write them out. So I might draw out like, this is something I want to try today or a shot that I'm trying to take on the microscope. And then I go to lab and I pick up and I see who's surviving, who's living there, and then go from there. Oh, wow. That's amazing. And now, you know, this is, this is a question for the future creative biologists on the call. But I, I think that you've definitely inspired some people to consider science and, and design and in tandem to start working on these things. And you've kind of mentioned a few, you know, tidbits of advice here and there for those getting started. But if I wanted to do what you do, you know, where should I start? And what are the good qualities of creative biologists and designers? Yeah, um, great question. I think the biggest thing is open-mindedness. So you have to be excited about a variety of things. So don't close yourself off too early from anything because you think, hey, it's not relevant everything's relevant actually. And everything that surrounds you in the natural world is great inspiration to become a creative biologist. So <clears throat> if you're the kind of person who likes to watch rainfall or you're the person who likes to watch um, milk boil or to have tea or to, I'm going in the very food direction, but basically anything in, in the world around you that you find very exciting, all of that is inspiration to do creative research, whether it's in biology or anything else. And anytime you look at something and you ask yourself, why does this exist? Or why does this shape happen? Why does this leaf have this shape? That's the beginning of the scientific research right there. So I always advise to keep a journal or however you like to put things down. You can draw, you can write, you can talk to someone. Any of these things are completely valid. And write down all of your ideas because everybody has great ones. Every single person has great ones. And that plus an inspiration journal of anything that you think is incredibly amazing, um, music, art, design, museums, anything, put that all in there. And then you have everything you need to be an amazing creative biologist and you'll take it in your own direction, um, probably different than me. And that makes us all richer. So that's great. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sunanda, for joining us this morning. Uh, you've certainly inspired me and you continue to do so. And we all look forward to seeing your future work uh, and, and all the amazing things you do. So now I wanna quickly remind the students before we log off and, and say goodbye to Dr. Sunanda once more um, about the fantastic talks we have uh, in Springs. Uh, so we're gonna cover cool topics such as virtual and artificial reality, what it's like to land on an asteroid with NASA 
and to actually take a bit of asteroid and study it. So that's the OSIRIS-REx mission, if you may have heard of it on the news. This is something that we're doing for the first time and we just successfully did it. So we're gonna connect you with a scientist who um, helped work on that mission. We're also gonna have an exciting talk on mathematics. So for all of you math nerds out there, me included, um, be sure to tune into that one. And in April, we're gonna talk about a very important um, and serious topic, and that's climate change. And I just cannot wait for you all to join us uh, for those fantastic talks. And now I wanted to take a moment to again, sincerely thank Dr. Sananda for joining us and for sharing her story and her expertise and her beautiful science and beautiful art with us. Um, that was totally so inspiring to us. And I wanted to thank the North Anglia students for asking absolutely incredible questions um, and for attending this call. I, I learned a lot through your questions as well. Uh, and I think Dr. Sananda really enjoyed answering them based off of the amount of time. She's like, great question. Um, so, so thank you so much. And I wanted to also give a, a shout out to the MIT Nord Anglia collaboration for making this whole inspiring series possible in, in the first place. So thank you again, Dr. Sananda for joining us and to everyone who's tuned in to today's call. And, and with that, we'll end it. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>